you don't cover the flaws but you make sure that whatever strengths are there they should not be censored we have to be more generous and more honest when we are actually observing and trying to understand history and have to look at it in its totality and our biases at times overrule us Assalamu alaikum everyone we are here today for another episode of raw pods we have with us sayed khawar mehdi who is a writer citizen activist accidental historian and a former physician scientist he has distinguished academic and corporate backgrounds and he is the founder of commonwealth karachi which is an independent think tank Khawar is well published with interest in governance historical research and urban activism with specific relevance to Karachi's role as economic keystone to the federation we are speaking to him today about an upcoming book of his he has compiled an autobiography that Iskandar Mirza had written about himself and he's worked hard to collect research and materials on this and to bring it to life about half a century after his death so it is going to be a very interesting conversation we're going to find out more about Khawar himself about his work his interest in the subject of course and also what he's trying to how he's trying to create a new narrative and introduce probably a narrative that already existed but was not shared that much so thank you very much for being here today Khawar Wa alaikum assalam Muniba I appreciate uh, arranging this podcast and open to any kind of questions about the memoirs. Um, so before we want to find out about the book, myself and the audience will be very keen on hearing more about you as a person, right? Mashallah, you have an okay. incredibly rich and very well diversified background, but it would be good to hear a little bit about it in your own words. Well, uh... Uh, you, in the introduction you just made, I believe that kind of covers it up. But just to give you an idea, I, uh, my background is a physician scientist. I left sciences, health sciences, pharmaceutical industry a good five years back. And I'm 100% focused on my passion, which is history and mostly history about Pakistan and more actually. But it started with uh, this particular, the quest to know more about uh, Skandar Mirza and uh, that brought me on the path and working on a couple of other books as well. So I'm very excited about it. And it's been a lovely journey, I must say, because as much as it's a passion, it's a discovery of oneself as well. You get to know more about yourself and you get to know more about others, especially when you are on a journey which is not planned, not charted. And as you're moving, you're charting, you're planning, and you're redefining your goals at every step. So it's been rewarding, I must say. That sounds really excited. And I think it makes me quite interested to know a little bit more about how you got to compiling this book together and why at this point in time. I mean, it is, I mean, you do mention your interest in history, but I'd love to know about the relevance and, you know, why you thought this was a good time and a good subject to approach. Well, uh, I wish uh, this book would have been published or the memoirs a good 50 years back. Uh, and you see, these were completed in 69. He died in 69. Skandar Mirza died in 69, and he completed it uh, in 69. Well, I shouldn't say completed. That's uh, uh, the time when he died. It was more or less complete. So, you know, I would say a good 90% of it was done. He started it in 67. So, but all, all these years, you know, uh, he was basically marginalized and ostracized by the, first of all, by Yupan's regime. And subsequently, as the establishments changed, they inherited this uh, marginalization of Skandar Mirza. And that attitude didn't change. And uh, his family did try uh, his daughters to some extent. And uh, But, uh, you know, there was so much pressure on the publishers. Uh, there was pressure on the media houses. So it didn't really got the kind of treatment it deserved. There were bits and pieces published, some in the book form, some actually serialization in different magazines, even translations. But again, these were bits and pieces. And so, most of the time, the editors would end up adding or subtracting things from it. So that didn't really help. So I landed on it. I'll be quite frank about it. I got it from my wife's mother. She's the daughter of Skandar Mirza. And what happened is that, you know, she shared it with me. And I, at that time, I was with the corporate world. 
And I, I took some time going through it and, and I found it very interesting. And I realized that this is a major task. I mean, that is professional attention. It has to be published to a proper publishing house other than to be taken on, you know, as an independent project. The more I read it, the more I discussed it with a couple of historian friends and different people at, in the academia. I realized it's going to be a very serious task because it's been more than 50 years. And a lot of people in Pakistan, I mean, history is not one of our favorite subjects here in Pakistan. We don't actually know much about our own country, our leadership. They, they have presidential libraries in USA. Like UK maintains archives, which are it's amazing. The, uh, the archiving in UK is just amazing, actually. I got a lot of my information from UK, the National Archives, the one in the Kew Gardens. So... To bring something which is a part of one's history is not going to be an easy task because it's something new and anything new is a threat it's, and the people start become a bit guarded and it will be questioned, it will be challenged, which is fine. I have no issue with being questioned and challenged because if you have got sound, strong grounds with uh, validated with facts and proper source material, then I mean, one shouldn't be scared of such uh, you know challenges. But by nature, I'm reluctant and resistant to getting new things. That was the challenging part. So I had to make sure that my sources were well documented. They were established sources. They were valid. And they're like the National Archives in UK, like the Wilson Center in US, host of publications. Then Arabian Digital Gulf Alliance, where I first found the documents I was looking for, some of it. And I realized it's not going to be a very straightforward journey because I had the memoirs ready. I could have just published it. No. So the corroboration, contextualization, and connecting it with the current, that was equally important. So that took me on this path of research, and it took a good five years. And last year, I started putting it all together. In the last March, we were when we finally realized that we are ready to go and actually go to the publishers. And so about a five years journey, and but a very, very rewarding journey in terms of learning more about my own country, the leadership, and what's been kept hidden from us. And it's, he's not the only one. I would say every bit of history must be checked, double check independently. Don't just rely on what state feeds you. You should have that desire to go and check it and to validate it with actual sources and from archives. And these archives are available not only in Pakistan, but all over the world. And it's not a difficult a task. I think anyone can do it. All you need is the drive and the passion. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you for that. I think it's incredible. Like I'm going to recap this in parts. But I think firstly, what strikes me is that this is where your passion met a little bit of a personal emotion, didn't it? Because you talk about, you know, your mother-in-law passing this down to you, but then history mm -hmm. being your passion as well. I think that it could only have taken a drive like that to spend five years researching and everything. And I can only imagine how, not only how rewarding and educational it was, but also how how challenging it's been naturally, because I can't imagine going through this kind of a journey, searching for archives that are 50 years and even older than that in different parts of the world as well. And then, you know, getting interest and in pitching a project to others and getting them to contribute. So it does sound very exciting. So can I understand when you talk about, you know, you mentioned looking at history from various angles, not just accepting one single narrative. And I think this is quite common around the world, right? You have one particular group of people telling history. And that's, I think, a very natural, I mean, it's probably part of human psychology as well, right? So whoever is in the lead is going to tell their perspective, but there are always a number of different perspectives out there. So can I understand, are you trying to challenge history by sharing this book? Or are you ju just trying to revive interest in a historical personality, get more people to start thinking about him, about him as a human being, right? So as a human being who went through his various journeys and, and so on. Um, both are equally important, I'd say. Yes, challenging history for sure. That's, that's very critical. That was one of the main reasons. But yes, to humanize the person and to show what he went through in terms of the challenges and how he faces that was uh, that was the secondary aspect you know but the primary was challenging the history is especially when the history you are challenging has got distortions fabrications and it has been uh, edited 
And uh, then I, I believe you have to, this is kind of your obligation as a citizen, uh, you, but you're trying to help the generation, you know, that uh, will be, that even the current generations don't know much about history, especially the ones coming down the road would hardly know anything. So this is an obligation, it's more like a personal, one can say a crusade to correct the history. But then again, on the personal part, uh, let me tell you very clearly, this is not a hagiography. I don't believe in that. This is not a tarif nama. The man had his strengths. He certainly had his strengths and then he had his weaknesses. And all statesmen, not every decision, not every move they make, not every policy they plan without flaws. Of course, some of his policies had flaws and that's why it led to the situation where after the martial law was imposed, within less than a month's time, he was sent packing. So yes, the idea is not a geography. The idea is to straighten the facts, present them to the people. That's exactly what the people of Pakistan deserve. And I think, I believe that, that I have, uh, to a major extent, have been successful in achieving that. But then again, I'm open to challenges. I don't mind being criticized. As you can see from the blurbs, I mean, I went to different sources and I welcomed all kinds of criticism, like uh, from what some of the top constitutional attorneys in Pakistan, as much as he has been very uh, much supportive. And he's also been very critical on certain aspects of the policy moves of General Skandar Mirza. And being the editor, I could have, you know, very smoothly edited it out. I did not. I accommodated it. And th that's the whole point. You don't cover the flaws. But you make sure that whatever strengths are there, they should not be censored. And that's what happened. He was censored by the state. Uh, when Ayub Khan took over, he made sure that his diaries were all confiscated. So these were his personal diaries. And had they been there, it would have been the easiest thing. And uh, what really impressed me about the person was that all these years in exile, he was sent to exile in 59. It was only in 67 he decided to write his memoirs. Now, why did it take so long for him? You know, he could have started from the day one. He did not. Because he believed in the decorum of the office that he left behind. He believed in giving respect to the country that uh, Pakistan. He believed that to in the fact that to criticize the current ruler would tantamount to criticizing the state of Pakistan. So he did not once ever in his exile bother to criticize Ayub Khan till Ayub Khan came up with the book Friends Not Masters. That triggered it. And there were a lot of lies in it. And that's that's when he realized that he has to uh, set the course correct and he has to present the other side of the story. And that's how he started writing the memoir. So this is something I don't think you'll see in this age. This is the old world uh, uh, to maintain the decorum, to be civilized enough not to criticize your country, not to criticize the leadership, because to criticize the leadership is the same as criticizing the August office, you know. And you criticize the office, you're criticizing the country. And being, uh, you know, loyal to your country, it does not reflect well on you. So I think that really impressed me about him. Yeah, it does sound like when you describe that, it I can only imagine the strength it took him, you know, after his personal diaries and everything were, were taken away to stay silent. And then given everything else that was going on. And you're right. I think in today's world, politics is all about criticism, right? Because that is about, um, I mean, that is crit in addition to policy, I feel like criticism or I should say in comparison to policy, I think criticism of the other side often, you know, takes precedence nowadays. So it is quite incredible. I am interested in knowing when you mentioned that a lot of his personal diaries were taken away, when he started rewriting, had he regained access to any of this material or was that lost forever? And whatever you have had access to now, was that written, you know, after a certain period of time? No, you see, well, uh, most of the, the mother's source of material was all taken away. But he started putting it all back together from memory. And it was a tough task for him because he wasn't doing that well. I mean, his health wasn't doing well. And it took him some time to put together. And then he would corroborate with this. I mean, you haven't read the memos because it's not out yet. But there's a whole, what's that, an interview that was taken by ex-ambassador Isfahani. That I have uh, put in this book, actually, it's all, it was audio recording. We have the audio recordings. And those were transcribed. And it, like friends like Iswahani, Ambassador Iswahani and others, you know, those were still in touch. There were many people you actually, what, it's very interesting. Once you get uh, censored by the state, no one wants to touch you. You become persona non grata. And that happened very much. But there were some very good people, good friends, who, while being in the government of Pakistan, they maintained their contact with them. And uh, hats off to them. There were people who didn't care for any kind of backlash from the state. 
that why are you meeting him and they maintain their contact. And that's why he started putting the facts together. And once you read the book and the acknowledgements and the, and the preface and the uh, afterward, you'll see how it was all put together and the people who helped him in achieving that task. Okay, that's quite interesting. I look forward to finding out more. I would love to know how exactly when you started compiling this together, how long the project took you and what kind of sources and materials you had to con uh, consult and how you manage your research around that. Well, in terms of the time frame, it took a good five years from the time I started. And uh, I mean, the interest was there from, from before, but the actual work, it took a good five years. Yes, in terms of the material, the sources, and the various archives, documents. I started with actually whatever I got, you know, from the family to begin with, you know, a lot of material. So that was mentioned in the acknowledgements. But then to that, I realized I need information which I would never be able to find in the family archives. And this was confidential information. So that's when I went to the National Archives. We have one in Islamabad as well. I contacted them, didn't get any response. I sent them emails. I called them. They were, they were polite. They were courteous. But it was leading nowhere. Then I was told, well, I mean, why don't you, you know, go through some uh, federal secretary, some Polana general, you know, person very well. I said, what's the point? I mean, if I have to go through all these sources and I being a Pakistani cannot access, I mean, it really doesn't make any sense. And I know even if I'll be given access, I won't be allowed to copy it. So I won't be able to use it in my book. So, I mean, there's no point. You know, wasting my time, actually, it will become a frustrating exercise. So the same material I started looking outside Pakistan, and I found some of it at the National Archives, like the Gwadar papers about his role and the acquisition of Gwadar. Uh, you see, this is the correspondence that the Pakistani uh, president, prime minister, and the foreign office were having with the British side, with their counterparts, you know. And naturally, if it's a correspondence, there are copies on both sides. I shouldn't have had a problem accessing it here. I am from foreign office. From the, usually these things get transferred from all departments of government towards the central repository, which is archives of the country. And in our case, I don't even know if they exist. And I'm sure they exist. But uh, these are some. Uh, these are treated so confidentially. I don't know uh, what exactly, because even we have a law where they get uh, declassified in the sense that after 25 years, you can access some of the, unless they are state secrets. And these don't happen to be state secrets, especially considering if Great Britain can declassify them, who have more at stake, considering they had colonies over half the world at one time. So why can't we do it? Any, anyhow, I got access to these documents. Some of the documents, I just knew about the title. So, But from the title, I mean, I could tell there was something interesting. So I requested for declassification. And um, what really impressed me about the British system, I mean, at the National Archives, the one at Kew Garden, I mean, I'm, I'm not a British citizen. I'm a Pakistani, a very proud Pakistani citizen. I was there. I'm a foreigner. I was given first class treatment. <laughs> I, I really am grateful for that. And I mean, you see, it's so simple. You're a researcher. You need something. You file, a, you fill a form, you apply for it, and they'll give you issue a reader's card. And then you just have to be uh, come up with a very clear reason why you need that document. And they'll give access if, if it's there. And there's a need to declassify again. You can file an application and they will look into it. And if it's not of national security in nature, they will declassify. So I got some of my very interesting documents from there. They added much value to the book, I must say. And it shows his role where at one point during during back and forth, the, the, I mean, the, the diplomacy that was happening the negotiations, there was a point where it was coming to a kind of a deadlock. That's when Skandar Mirza gave a very, very polite, whale threat to Great Britain that if it's not decided in Pakistan's interest, Pakistan can well leave the Commonwealth. Now, this is the time when a president of Pakistan can give, stand up to Great Britain and twist their arm and achieve what he wanted. And he showed that, you know, of course, they were the sitting, the prime minister of the time, the foreign office, they were all very instrumental and they played a very critical role as well. But it was him who was hands-on in foreign policy because that was absolutely his passion, you know. So, I mean, um, this is just one example of the sources and the documents. And then there were multiple sources, individuals, some who want to remain anonymous. But then again, when you have, like, they would give me the information, but they don't want the names to be mentioned. But this information is well validated and corroborated with actual sources and everything. My own archives in Pakistan, they had uh, cooperated with me. It would have been a richer book. 
Uh, maybe down the road, if there's a second volume, I can work on it. But till then, you know, this is a good example for them to open up the archives and for the researchers, you know. And uh, someone maybe says, someone wants to challenge this, but he should have equal access as well to the archives. And I'm open to that. Yeah, that's quite interesting how you found access to archives in the UK more easily than you did in your own country. I, I think it says a lot about what things that we should possibly be challenging in terms of education, in terms of access to information and to history. But that's a whole, that's another discussion in itself. I will come back to more questions about the book and your objective and everything. But I think for our listeners, let's paint, paint a little bit of a picture as Sikand, uh, of Sikandar Mirza the human, right? A little bit about mm -hmm. his life, you know, just a few snippets of it, just to kind of humanize him for the listener, because I'm sure, you know, yeah. at, by this time, they'd be very interested in knowing a little bit more. Yeah, I'll give you a synopsis of it. He was born in what is called Mumbai nowadays, Bombay. And it was the first one to graduate from Sanders. There were five Indians who were sent and natives. Because earlier Sanders was only for the, I mean, for the Britishers and then again for the white race. And they were the first five non-Britishers. And out of the five, only he's the one who graduated. It's not that the other ones failed, but I think a couple of them, two of them died. Oh, uh, two of them probably didn't complete it and one of them I don't know exactly but he's the only one who ended up graduating and with honors and he was I mean then commissioned in the British Indian Army and after that uh, he was seconded to the uh, to the Indian political service and then he, he had a wonderful career as an administrator all over the, the British subcontinent at the time uh, he was po posted as a, uh, a deputy commissioner, as a political agent to the various principalities. And then in KP, he had a wonderful time. He was fluent in Pashto, by the way. The man spoke Pashto very well. And he was an honorary Yusufzai. Patanas made him an honorary Yusufzai at the time. And his, one of his best friends was Dr. Khan Saab, who was uh, Far Khan Bacha Khan's brother. And though they were politically in opposite camps, but see, such was the civility and the, I would say, uh, decorum of the time that people, in spite of maintaining their political differences, they could be very civil and yet maintain good friendship. There, uh, there, there are instances where they would be playing bridge while Kansa was in the jail across the bars and he would be on this side, you know, the deputy commissioner and they were playing bridge, you know. So, I mean, my, my point is that friendship, very important, but then your obligation, your responsibility as an administrator, are supreme. So you can maintain both. So well, the man, I mean, uh, then he got he got married to Rifa Shirazi, seven children from her. The eldest uh, was daughter, then there was a son, then there were daughters, and then, then the youngest, the youngest uh, actually died in an air crash in PA. He was with Pakistan Air Force in the, and he's buried in Peshawar. And uh, his entry into uh, Pakistan's political game was not exactly something of his planning. It's just something that evolved. It happened with time. Again, you know, when it comes to his policies, those are open to question. I'm not here to defend his policies. But what really I find very interesting in this book, you'll see this interview that is copied from Voice of America. It was on the 10 years of Pakistan, on the first 10 years of Pakistan. And the three main people, Ahmed Khan, the constitutional lawyer, Javed Jabbar, the senator, and Professor Jafar Ahmed, historian, according to Hamid Khan, that period, the ten year, first 10 years, it seemed like was far better in terms of the rights, in terms of the freedom of press, and in terms of the economy compared to what we have today. But that certainly says a lot. The GDP was growing at a phenomenal rate. Pakistan had no loans at the time. We only look at people through one particular lens. We have to be more generous and more honest when we are actually observing and trying to understand history and have to look at it in its totality. And our biases at times overrule us. And that's very common, especially when it's the state, the state narrative is one where you have to fit a personality in alignment with the narrative of the state. Even Kaidyazam wasn't spared, nor was Fatma Jinnah. The Kaidyazam we know today. We as in the school children, we as in the masses, we as in the population, is a very different kind of asan. The Jinnah as he was, we don't want to present that Jinnah. The Iqbal as he was, Fatma Jinnah, and so many others. So my point is that the history should be left to the historians. 
the state should not interfere with it. That's where the mess starts because these are the foundation blocks to nation building. And if the nation building is taken up purely by the state without any checks and balances by the historians, then certainly you're building something that is weak foundations. And weak foundation means weak people. Weak people means weak leadership. And weak leadership spells disaster for the country. Yeah, what you said is very interesting. And I think although this is deviating a little bit from what you know, the core subject that we're here to discuss, but I do think that in the digital age with more access to information, in the absence of formal education that is addressing those gaps, I do think that more some of those questions start to be answered or at least more questions start to be asked. But that said, of course, that is not a replacement for education policy and opening up more discussion and debate within that itself. So that's, I think it's incredible that you are trying to do, uh, recreate a lost narrative of sorts with your work. Can I ask a little bit about, I know you've touched upon it briefly, you want to show the human side to him, you want to retell a lost story of sorts, right? Can I request you to elaborate on your objective for this work? Well, the basic objective is to restore history, the missing chapter. This is a missing chapter of Pakistan, and that very little is known about, and whatever is known is basically through the state's narrative. And it's a very weak narrative, it's an incomplete narrative, and there are a lot of distortions in it. And that has to be corrected. It's all in good spirit. It's not to, I mean, I'm very proud of my country and I can totally understand why establishment did what they did. But then a time has come, like you just said, this is the digital age. If the state, if they don't take the initiative, the people won't wait. The people will do it on their own. In this age, there's no such thing as confidentiality. People can get access to sites, through hacking and through all. And then information is there to be shared here. It will be in good spirit that the state actually decides and opens up the archives and this information because it really helps in better insightful decision making for the future generations. And another way is to be closeted, to be paranoid and to withhold everything and keep close to my heart. And that doesn't help. You don't win the confidence of the people. But my objective, I believe, is very much uh, on the path to accomplishment because, I mean, this book is something that whatever, I mean, feedbacks I've heard from academics at the Oxford University at Southampton and Francis uh, Robinson, Ian Talbot, and uh, Dr. Devji, who's at Oxford again, and of course, many historians and academics from Pakistan, that this is a very important task that we should start challenging history. Challenging doesn't mean that I'm out there to rule out. I'm there to condemn it. No. I'm there to actually cleanse it of artifacts, aberrations, and all kind of abstraction that has been introduced into it and give a more clear picture to present how it happened and really important that it should be properly validated with the main sources. So I think the objective is very much, uh, I would say, I'm happy with it. Mm -hmm. If not totally achieved, I'm on the right track. Yeah. And I think it's very interesting as well that you said, even earlier on in the conversation, you indicated that your intention was never to glorify the personality, but to show a human side, like you said, share a missing chapter of history. I know this is spraying a little bit into the book and it's not yet published, but a little bit from the extracts that you shared with me. I did notice that you showed Sikandar Mirza expressing that he is regretting some of his previous decisions. So there is an entirely, I imagine, without having read it as yet, there is an almost human kind of progression through life and possibly one that we as humans do go through. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I believe there is an element of coming to terms with himself in the sense that, he, like you just said, that he thinks what happened, what he got is what he deserved. He said that. So the man is, I would say, honorable enough to admit his faults. and But he was also very keen to set the record straight. So as much as he is honorable enough to admit his faults, he was very keen to share his side of the story and leave it for the historians to judge and decide, you know. And it's not the last word. Again, it's not the last word. And that's why ever more the reason for the archives, for the information in various departments of government 
that it should be open and accessible to the people and to the common people. I don't have to go through some federal secretary. You know, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. If a foreigner sitting in Pakistan can go to Great Britain and get it just by filling one form, why can't anyone in Pakistan get access to their own information from their own country? Yeah. So when you say that, I think that really helps set the expectation for what we should look forward to in the book. So typically, who do you think would be the readers of this book? And equally, who should be the readers of this book? I would say, well, you see, that the typical traditional answer would be historians. And I'd say historians usually have the ways of finding out facts, you know. An average Pakistani, not just academics, I would say students, I'd say journalists, I'd say people who are interested to know more about Pakistan. And it should not be restricted to historians. Because, you know, when you restrict it to historians, that's a very academic crowd, which is wonderful. And if they're endorsing me, I mean, that will be an honor for me. But by restricting to the very, I would say, kind of a rarefied crowd, you are preventing the dissemination of information. It should be, at uh, like in the curriculum, I would say, uh, recommended reading at the universities. It should be like recommended reading at the National Defense University. Because these are the people who will become our policy makers. They'll be leading the country. I mean, our leadership comes from bureaucracy, political leadership, the military leadership. They all should be leading it. This is their history. It's no one else's. One should never be ashamed of knowing one's history. You know, One should share it in totality. I mean, the way they, I mean, you read the American history books, the way they scrutinize in the parliament in Great Britain, they don't spare you at all. I mean, they, they, they tear you apart to shreds. I mean, I know more about Thomas Jefferson than I know about Kaita Azam. Now, isn't that sad? That's so sad. It's a sad reflection of my education system. Why do I? I don't need to know much about Thomas Thomas Jefferson. I do. I, I guess I know more about George Washington and I know about Lakhtari Khan, who's a total mystery, by the way. We know nothing about him. I know more about, uh, I will say, Golda Meir from Israel than I know about Fatma Jinnah. That is sad. That's very, very sad. Why isn't the state getting out of the way? Let the historians take up the task and share history with the people. That's how it happens. It's not state's job. I think that's very well said. And I really hope that not only do people who are making policy decisions, but also the common man, particularly, like you said, students and young people start to take more interest in history and start to try and understand what has happened, what are the missing chapters. And like you said, educate themselves on our people from our past, people who made decisions, people who mattered, what went on in their lives. And also with great people, I think it's very important to understand what made them great. What should our society be providing to its youth and its children in order to create the same kind of personalities that we used to have in the past? So I'm, I'm really excited. Thank you for writing this book. Honestly, I think anybody who's trying to piece together knowledge, history, or, you know, any piece of knowledge and share it with the common public. I think ultimately the goal is to serve people through books and through this kind of knowledge. And I think it is ultimately a community service of sorts. So I would say thank you for that. I would be interested in knowing, I know you're launching the book in London at the Pakistan Literature Festival on Saturday, inshallah. What other plans do you have? Where else and, you know, how else are you launching the book? Well, this is going to be the first launch, the one in London at the PLF at this coming Saturday. And we have plans for a series of launches in Pakistan and hopefully abroad as well. The next grand event would be the other festival that's in November in Karachi. But in between, we plan to launch it in different universities at different think tanks all over Pakistan. And there's been a lot of interest from uh, international distribution houses and publishing houses to publish European version. And I believe there'll be slight, I mean, that everything remains the same uh, other than the cover, which I believe according to the market, they will alter or change it for something like that. So there are a lot of plans for Pakistan and abroad both. And mostly it will be dealt by the publisher, especially in, uh, you know, the whatever agreements they have. Of course, it will need my consent. And there is a second part to this book also, which I I have plans for. I've gathered the material, but I'm not sure if I'll be taking it. I may actually hand it over because it's more serious stuff. I will actually hand it over to some historian, you know. 
So that's the second part, you know. You know. But still true. in the process. Hmm. Yeah. And again, uh, most of the material I got from the National Archives okay. and the one at the Kew Garden, you know. Yeah, no, it's an incredible journey. And I am sure it's an incredible story that you're telling through this book. Very excited about it. Are you planning to write something else in the future? I know you've mentioned part two. You've mentioned handing it over to others, but it would be great to have you continue to write and tell stories. Well, there is. been working for on it for the last three years. This is about Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali. Now, it's, it's very different. It's very, very different. It's not usual two-page chapter we read in Pakistani curriculum about Tipu Sultan, how brave he was, how he fought. And no, it's much more than that. It celebrates his life. See, we don't celebrate the life as much as we celebrate the death. Somehow that's our culture, you know. And he did so much in his life. He was an excellent administrator. His governance was amazing. His political acumen, his diplomacy was most impressive. At that time, he was one of the few rulers who made overtures to USA, to France, to Afghanistan, to Egypt, to other countries. The book I'm working on, that uh, most interestingly starts in Cape Town. I was in Cape Town six years back with my wife for a scientific conference, and we decided to take a little vacation after the conference, and we were at one of the very old vineyards. It's, it's a museum, and it's a lovely place, you know, spread on hundreds of acres. And they took us through the museum, and at the end of the hallway, there was this big painting. I could tell there was something Mughal about the painting. I said, what is this painting doing in Cape Town in a vineyard, you know? So I asked my host and said, I have no idea. Well, then I wondered, but I really don't know. And I said, let's go. I walked over and there's this impressive Mughal figure, six foot tall painting and with a sword in his hand. I said, who is he and what is he doing here? And why would he be here? I said, I really have no clue about it. So I said, I would like to meet the curator. So they arranged a meeting and the curator actually was on vacation. And well, okay. So they gave me a number, an email. I called and she said, why don't you email and I'll see what I can do. I did. And again, look at this. I'm, I'm basically there for like six, seven days. And I sent an email and I got a response. As soon as I came back to Pakistan, the response was there. And she was still on vacation, the curator. She went back to the museum. She went to the, the basement to take the documents from the Vineyard archives. And she said, this gentleman is the Raish Khan. He's Tipu Sultan's ambassador on his way to Versailles. He stopped midway at the Cape of Good Hope. At that time, Cape Town was Cape of Good Hope. And here, basically, to spend some time. I mean, you would always break the journey in those days. And this was a, it's a top secret mission. We don't know why he is going to Versailles, but it's a secret mission. And a very interesting account, how he spent the days and how they cooked biryani there in Cape Town. <laughs> it happened. But from Cape Town, it goes to Versailles. From Versailles, the story goes to back to India, then to Delaware Bay, USA, then back to India. It's very interesting. And this is about diplomacy of Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali. You'll hear of ships and racehorses being named after Hyder Ali and Tipu at the time by the Americans during the Civil War. They were so impressed by the father son. That is incredible. So we do not read about all of this in our history books. We hardly. We just yeah. came through it. And yeah. this is to celebrate. And it's amazing. You know, we just, I mean, we were fighting. Mm. That's the ultimate. So, yeah. I mean, why not celebrate the life? Why not celebrate his accomplishments while he was alive? There's so much to do, you know. Yeah. First time I'm hearing about the fact that he had sent a diplomatic mission to the U.S. and that the U.S. was inspired. To the worst time. Yeah. To, 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 to the worst time, France. Okay. Yes. And to, to U.S., he had a diplomatic correspondence with them. But okay. with Versailles, he actually had sent a mission. There were four people in the mission, you know, and they spent a good two to three months there. And the Raish Khan, while he was in Versailles, mm -hmm. you see how, again, I mean, that one portrait which survived made it. Mm -hmm. This lady in the court of Louis XVI, she was a uh, good friend of Louis XVI, and she wanted to paint him make his portrait and he refused i'm a muslim you know you cannot make my portrait mm -hmm. but when the king she went to the king and she complained and the king says okay i'll take care and he called the rich and the rich and of course had to oblige the king because that could have meant the worsening of relations between mysore and france so he did 
And he wanted, after the painting was done, he kept it behind his bed. He wanted to destroy it. So the lady found out. She sent a servant late night who stole it. He brought it back. And that painting survives to this day. It was sold at Sotheby's auction. Probably some Arab prince got it for a couple of million pounds. But it's an amazing painting. Yeah. No, I would love to see it. And I'm getting excited about this work already. Can I ask how exactly are you researching this? Because oh. I, I imagine that this would definitely not be easier than the work you've already done. Given that it's it would, a lot older. It would be yeah. much more difficult. Much right. more. Because here I was, oh, my research was confined to Great Britain, Pakistan, and the Arabian Digital Gulf Alliance and Wilson Center, which already organized the places by and large, most of them. Here I'll have to go to India and to get the visa, that will be the most difficult task. Mm -hmm. I'll have to, uh, I've already been to Cape Town, I have all the information. I may have to go to France, I may. Uh, as for the American records, I've been corresponding with them and I got some of those records, you know, and if I need more, I'll see if I can get those or I'll, maybe in one of my visits, I'll have to get, uh, get access to those. And that will be challenging. It may take time, but it's something very exciting. So I'm not going to give up on that. I love that you call history exciting. I think the work that you're doing, honestly, is incredible. I am very, very interested in reading what you've already done and also looking forward to the Tipu Sultan work. I'll be happy to share. I'll be very happy to share. And let's hope I managed to get all the you know documents and facts together. Yeah, inshallah. No, I'm sure it would be challenging. But again, like you said, it's exciting and rewarding work. So yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation, by the way. Like, And I'm seeing it off, not just for the podcast, but personal note. I really enjoyed it. I think more people need to be doing this kind of work and definitely more people need to be reading it. And it's very kind of you. I thoroughly enjoyed and I look forward to meeting you again. Thank you. A pleasure and a privilege you know, to be interviewed by you. Thank you. Thank you very Good much. Day. See you Good soon. Love. Thank you. Bye.